and we have a different, then it's not normal. So we have at 2.50 p.m., we have an explosion that everyone is now well aware of. Um, where it occurs, originally, near the finish line, we're, we're hearing in the real-time crime center, we're hearing radio transmissions about people finishing, about this, you know, this is where we are, and it's just business as usual, and then it's kaboom, literally. Now, the area where this occurred, it's not unusual for manhole explosions to occur. It's an old section of the city. It's, it's insufficient wiring and everything else. Manholes pop all the time up there. And, and it's, it's not the first thought I had, and there are some in the room who were with me, and, and I said it, you've got to be kidding me. A manhole on the marathon, this is, you know, first, you know, if it pops, the sore cover goes up, the manhole covers are heavy. It could be injured, it could be steam. But that's my thought, is that this is just an anomaly. This is a bad timing thing. And then with the radio transmissions that were occurring, that we heard, um, it was not a manhole explosion. This was no question about it immediately. No question about it. This was a combat situation. This is an IED. If you, all you have to do is listen to the, to the transmissions. It's very similar to what you'll hear from the transmissions coming from the, the military personnel when they're under fire or they're being blown up. That's what, that's what that radio transmission sounded like. There were bodies everywhere. There were body parts everywhere. There was debris everywhere. We had these metal stanchions that we put up the whole route. Those just became flying objects. I mean, there were things, there were missiles everywhere that were flying around there. And some of them were body parts that were flying around through the crowd. Um, we had cops right there. When you, when you look at these, look for the yellow reflective vest. Those are all cops. They're right there. They're right on top of little kids and families watching the, the finish line. There. Um, then we have the reports of a second explosion. So here's the first explosion on the right hand side. Now this is a, if not this exact image, many like it have been, have been pretty uh, publicly available. Um, on the right hand side you see the yellow, that, that's the explosion, that's the flame. The yellow line at the bottom is the actual finish line, so that's how close people are. On the left hand side of that photograph, is the viewing bleachers where you'd have uh, public officials, dignitaries, uh, the elite runners, the, the uh, staff of the BAA, the organizer of the Boston Marathon. Um, you can see that's at the 409 mark of the Boston Marathon. Anyone that's run a marathon knows if you're running a 409 marathon, that's pretty good marathon for recreational runners. But it's also, as I said earlier, that's the, the key time for our finishers. We have the bulk, and you'll see in a second, we have the bulk of our runners finishing in that, that time period. So everyone that you see on the roadway is a runner. And you see the, the blue fence, and behind that blue fence and under the flags are all the debris, all the uh, things that became debris, all the metal barriers that we have. So that explosion, you get people aren't even startled yet. So that, that photograph was captured literally at that detonation time. This is the second bomb. It's about 500 feet away. It's 12 seconds in time later. And this view is if you were running and you were heading towards that first bomb, bomb would be down on the left-hand side. This is still on the same side of the street as the first bomb. But you can see where that goes in the puff of smoke. But I would draw your attention to black overhanging traffic lights. Look beyond it and you'll see the smoke filling the air from the first bomb. So that's how close in time they were and close in proximity they were. And you can see cops now in the yellow vest starting to draw their attention both from the sound of the explosion as well as the radio transmission. So that's what we're looking at. Uh, this is all within 12 seconds. Bomb one, bomb two, 12 seconds. This is an overview just to give you an idea of the type of neighborhood we're in. Uh, if you're familiar with the Copley Square area of the Back Bay in Boston, um, Newbury Street, Shopping Paradise, a uh, place my wife spends a lot of, a lot of my money, uh, is right <laughs> in the next street over. It's high-end boutiques. Lots and lots and lots of people there on every day, not just because of the marathon. Uh, offices and buildings along the route that were open. Uh, restaurants that were, that were chock full, and most of them had outdoor sidewalk seating as well, uh, which led to, to uh, some of the, the casualties that we had there as well. 
So this is uh, the seam once it's stabilized, for lack of a better term. Um, this is actually not exactly uh, right away. This is probably some time afterward. But you can see the ambulances there. You can see uh, the response that we had in that area. Um, I will tell you a lot of what we were dealing with at that time was fear. I mean, there was a lot of fear uh, that was coming in from everyone. It was all over social media. It was all over police radio. We didn't know who did it. We didn't know if there were more. We had secondary devices. For those of us in this business, we know you always get concerned about secondary de devices. That's a tactic of people who look to harm others, right? We're looking for tertiary devices. We're looking for, we have to go in there and do some checking. You know, we've got, by the way, we've got dead bodies on the ground there. And we've got body parts literally all over the place up there. Smashed up against the glass on the buildings, the facades of buildings. Um, so it, there's a biohazard scenario going on up there. There's a crime scene going on up there. Um, there is a human element that's going on up there because all those first responders didn't just show up, they were there. They were victims as well, they were part of this. So we had, we had a lot of significant challenges going on that day. Um, big issue for us, reconnecting runners with their families and family members with their runners. Because people get taken to the hospital. There, there were, you can see 264 injured. There were a lot of people transported, not just an ambulance, they were put in police transport wagons and taken to emergency rooms it was like a mash scenario going on up there. You get them where they could, there were tourniquets being applied. Um, there were a lot of loss of limb, everyone knows that now from media coverage. Lots of loss of limb, it's indicative of IED explosions. So we were staging assets coming in from other agencies. My office was part of that coordination plan. A lot of it was calling in, people calling in saying, Danny, we've got SWAT coming in, where do you want them? We have this coming in, where do you go? And I, I can now, understand the, the, the role even after 9-11, NYPD had this as well. Everybody wants to help, everybody's coming in, but you're creating a little bit bigger problem for us logistically. And by the way, we don't know what's going on yet. We don't know if in another 20 minutes if another bomb goes off someplace. No one, 